This is a Thorium Energy Alliance Technology Talk from the inaugural Future of Energy Conference, October 2009. To find out more about Thorium Energy, please visit thoriumenergyalliance.com. This talk is from Dr. David LeBlanc of Carleton University, whose topic is Liquid Fluoride Reactors, a Luxury of Choice. Now, I'm going to start with what's called the traditional design. Uh, a lot of you are very familiar with this. This is part of the, uh, this slide comes directly from what's called the Gen 4 program, Generation 4 program for advanced reactors. So what we call the single fluid graphite moderated molten salt free reactor. Molten salt is sort of the older term for liquid fluoride. Uh, I'll probably be uh, slipping up and going back and forth in the terms here. But in general, molten salt reactor has your fissile and or fertile material dissolved in a carrier salt, which will... Um, which goes through a critical core, in this case moderated by graphite. It's only critical in that region, energy is produced. Uh, and the salt itself, with the fissile and fertile, comes out, gives its heat up to intermediate heat exchanger. Uh, so that's a nice clean salt that then gives up its heat to either the old way where there was a steam Rankine cycle. Uh, we figure now much better to go to a helium or supercritical carbon dioxide uh, gas turbine. Uh, a lot of the uh, amazing things about single fluid, I'm not going to be able to get into a lot of things, but a lot of the, the safety. Um, we can drain the salts very simply to uh, sort of dump tanks. If you do absolutely nothing at all, we have this frozen plug of salt that if the salt starts to get too hot, it just melts that plug and it drains. So there's no operator action needed whatsoever. Now, I'm gonna give a lot of data here that you don't really need if you want. You can look over the slides later. That just shows the composition of the salt. It's what's called a, uh, well, enriched lithium and beryllium fluoride. They call it FLIB. Uh, so you mix in with thorium and, uh, well, of course, the fissile part, the U233 that's created from the thorium. We use a nickel alloy called Haspaloy N uh, for all the piping, the heat exchangers, the outer vessel, et cetera. Pretty hot operation, uh, 565 inlet, 700 degrees Celsius outlet. So that gives us pretty high efficiencies. The old way on steam was about 44%. If we go to the gas cycles, et cetera, we're getting up to about 48% efficiency. And in this design, which again, I call the traditional design, the fission products, we can continuously remove those, uh, was on a 20 day cycle. Now protactinium, now we're getting into some of the, the more technical details. Thorium doesn't instantly turn into uranium-233, it has an intermediate, protactinium, and that takes close to a month, well, a half-life of close to a month, to decay to U-233. So in a lot of designs, this included, we really need to take that out of the salt and sort of just sit it on the side, let that decay to uranium-233, then put it back in the core. And there's some issues with that, which I particularly don't like, but we can get around that. That was done on a 10-day cycle. Startup fissile inventory needed about 1,500 kilograms of uh, uranium-233 to start. We can start these on transuranics. This particular design is not very amenable to be started on low enriched uranium, but other designs can be. To give you a comparison, a PWR is about five tons or five and a half tons of U-235 uh, design. The breeding ratio, uh, back then everything was about breeding. We, we need to produce fuel to really start more and more reactors. We don't care about that anymore. We don't even want it. Was a, a modest 1.06, so 6% more fuel made per year than uh, and that gives you a 20 year doubling time, which was fairly competitive with their main competitor, which was the uh, liquid sodium or sodium cooled fast breeding reactor. Now, general benefits of any liquid floor design all your volatile fission products, the gases, noble metals don't really, uh, they don't do anything in the salt, they just sort of come out, they played out. All those things, they just naturally, passively come out of the salt. We collect them from the pump bowl, et cetera, the xenon gas, and we just store them separately. So if there's any kind of accident, yes, if a pipe, pipe breaks, the salt will spill, nothing's really going to come out of it. There's no driving mechanism here. Well, of course, we have nothing. There's no such thing as a melt time because we're already liquid. Uh, the salt's at very high boiling point, so we don't have to operate these at, uh, at any kind of pressure. There's no pressure vessel. There's nothing that can fail. Uh, a temperature increase in the system instantly lowers reactivity. We always want that, of course. There's no possible steam explosions, nothing that can produce hydrogen. Uh, you don't need a massive containment building that's rated up to many, many PSI to contain all that steam that could come from a PWR trying to, trying to cool the core. We've got nothing that really drives anything, okay? Uh, we don't need control rods. We typically put them into the design to, uh, uh, for, for quick shutdown, et cetera, but we can just drain the salts. We don't need burnable poison. So there's almost no excess reactivity. That's another source of potential accidents. And as I mentioned before, we have this simple freeze plug that just melts and drains to passively cool dump tanks. Now, I want to get into some fundamentals because I'm going to be talking about different designs than this. And the first is between single fluid and two fluid. And Oak Ridge National Labs was the main developers of these in the 50s, 60s, and 70s. Uh, and they looked at both, both these ways. Single fluid is obviously just one fluid, has both your fissile and fertile material, the uranium-233 and the thorium. The two fluid design has separate salts for each. You have one salt called a blanket salt that has the thorium tetrafluoride and a fuel salt that just has the uranium-233. So um, a lot of the advantages of this, it really improves your reactivity coefficients, uh, simplifies fission product removal, and that's the main thing. Thorium really complicates things. I'll get more back to that in a minute. 
and we can remove that need for getting, uh, pulling out the protactinium. Our blanket salt is, is dirt cheap. We can have a lot of it. We can dilute the protactinium that's created. We don't have to pull it out. Uh, now, it, it does or it can complicate core design, and that was what Oak Ridge struggled with, but not as much as thought as I'll try to convince you. Now, there's also what's called a one and a half fluid design, Monica Gwynn thing. It's sort of a mix of both types. You have a mixed salt in the central core region, and you put a blanket salt around it. It's got some of the advantages of both, but it also has some of the disadvantages of both. Uh, now, Oak Ridge's work on the two fluid was most of the 60s was on two fluid. And to have your core, you've got these two fluids, they felt, well, we need to interlace them. So you had this very complicated plumbing, um, very complicated plumbing arrangement of graphite where you'd have tubes of graphite that were carrying this fuel salt, and between these tubes was the blanket salt, and then around the whole core, okay? And that plumbing, graphite uh, under irradiation start, first starts to shrink a bit and then swell. It was a real plumbing nightmare. Uh, and that's really sort of what killed that. But there's so many other great advantages of what's called a two fluid design. Now, some fundamentals here on fuel processing. Very easy to remove uranium from any molten salt, liquid fluoride. You simple, simply bubble through fluorine gas and it converts UF4 to UF6, which is gaseous. And we can convert that back later. Uh, protactinium may require removal in some designs. Your stable fission products, the ones that will just sit in the salt, uh, most importantly the rare earths, they can be removed by either what's called liquid bismuth reductive extraction, which is a little bit complicated, uh, or what's called vacuum distillation, where you're basically just boiling off or evaporating off the carrier salt to recycle it and leaving behind the fission products after you've removed the uranium-233. But that only really works for two fluid designs. Um, it's the thorium because it's so chemically similar to the rare earths, that's what really complicates fission product removal in single fluid designs. Uh, now, fission product removal can range from about 10, 20 days, like in the early days. Uh, some of the designs, like the French work, can be up to several years, or not at all, and I'll get into that as well. Maybe we don't need to do fission product removal at all. Graphite behavior, just very briefly, graphite we use uh, to help the moderation slowing down the neutrons, works very well with the salt. Um, but in any use of graphite in a reactor, we have this shrinking and then swelling issue. So it gives us a limited lifetime. If we have very large cores, low power density, then we can get uh, decades and decades of use, or maybe only a few days. Uh, so not a few days, a few years. Now, long-term waste reduction. That's another big plus of molten salt reactors in any design we look at. It's because it's mainly the, lo the long-lived radiotoxicity is from transuranic elements. Plutonium, neptonium, americium, the minor actinides. Um, so if we can minimize transuranic waste, then our disposal issue goes down to a few hundred years instead of a few million or a few hundred thousand. Now, uh, again, we don't have really time to get into the details of this graph. I'll show some French work here comparing a PWR, a fast breeder reactor, and a liquid fluoride reactor. A PWR, because you're the once through design at least, you've got several hundred kilograms of transuranics. Those are much more radiotoxic. So that blue line is showing the radiotoxicity of the, the waste per uh, well, gigawatt thermal year. Uh, the dashed line is the fission products, and everyone has pretty much the same fission product waste. So after a few hundred years, the fission products, they've pretty much decayed down to next to nothing, whereas with the actinides, that's what's so active. Now, a fast breeder reactor, yes, oh, we put them all back, we burn them all off too. Well, any kind of chemical process is never going to be 100% successful. I've got a lot of debates with some of the experts on this. Uh, a common assumption is 0.1% loss during your processing. Uh, and if you put that number to a fast breeder, they're doing a lot better than a PWR, but they're still fairly radiotoxic for quite a while. Whereas with the liquid fluoride reactor, because there's so little transuranics, we're starting so low on the, uh, um, the, the chain down at 232 and 233, uh, we get down to less than sort of uh, the, the, radioactive, the radiotoxicity of the ore you'd need for PWR after just a few hundred years. So that's pretty much for any liquid fluoride. Yeah. Now, proliferation, this gets into a contentious issue. Um, and you've got to worry about both the national program and subversion to terrorist activity, et cetera. Um, the, what we call the pure thorium cycle should be at least as good, probably better, than our other conventional reactors, which are all pretty good and we're all well regulated. Just to give you some of the advantages here, when we, produce, when we have this cycle, we always get a fair amount of what's called uranium-232. It's got a pretty short but long enough half-life, 69-year half-life, and it's got a really strong gamma ray in the, uh, in, in the decay chain. So that makes detection really easy, makes it very, very difficult to work with. No national program has ever been based on U-233. Uh, and also, and this was a su suggestion of Kirk Sorsen a few years ago, we can always instantly denature our salt. It's a liquid. If we're running with U-233 in the salt, we can always just, on a moment's, no mo moment's no notice, dump in uh, natural or depleted uranium, and then it's going to be useless for any kind of weapon.